before moving there, uh, I would like to also tell you about today's agenda. Uh, there, I will be discussing with you about the details of the marketing plan. And then uh, Magua and Saitam will deliver their class on virtual economy, how to finance your virtual products and virtual companies. And they will also talk about the NFTs, the non-fungible tokens and their significance and many other related subjects. So let's begin talking about the marketing plan. I have my slides over here. Please take a look at them. You will see the main points I will be telling you about your marketing plans. So for your final project presentations, which is due on the finals week, you will be handing in the final version of your marketing plans too. Uh, and this presentation will also cover the information you gather for your marketing plans. So creating a well-organized, detailed, and clear marketing plan that covers all the aspects that I will talk about in a minute is highly important. And firstly, based on your comments from last week's class, I want to clarify this. Beginning from the first week on, you submitted a total of three assignments, and these assignments have allowed you to build your marketing plan step by step towards your final projects. So each week, adding new information on top, your project will reach its final form. And I would like to remind you, remind you of a few points about this marketing plan that you are working on. As you know, for this class, you were firstly expected to come up with a virtual product idea, which is based on certain research and analysis of the market in Second Life. And as an entrepreneur, we all need a plan to follow up and this plan will guide our business. And the business, the business plan starts from how the product idea is originated, progresses through the design and building of the product. We have already done that part. Then pricing, determining a price level for your product, making a cost analysis, preparing your budget, development of your marketing strategies, and deciding on how to communicate your product to your potential buyers, which is the marketing communication part. Then you have to identify your sales points. You have to set some goals for your product, which will be like sales and re revenue generation. And you have to track and evaluate the performance of your product after you introduce it to the market. So as you can see here in the slide, a marketing plan is a comprehensive document and it outlines an organization's overall marketing efforts for a specific period of time. So it's a roadmap, by the way, that guides the company in achieving its marketing objectives. So it's a key component of a business plan. And it's very important for effective strategic planning. So planning is everything, don't forget it. As you remember, you started with a detailed market analysis. Let me come back to the first slide. The aim of the market analysis was to identify the size of the market, meaning the current size and the potential in the future. So you looked for some key market trends and try to figure out what the market currently looks like and try to estimate its potential in the future. So the assignment you already delivered, the first assignment should include these parts. So we wanted to see what your analysis for the market was. So while doing this, you navigated through the marketplace and you made some web research and you tried to discover the specific needs present in the current market. And by doing that, you made your own analysis on what are some needs that are not yet met. So the aim of this kind of an analysis is to understand the gaps in the marketplace and you try to fill the gap with your product idea. And with the information you gathered, it led you to a very important step of your marketing plan, which is identifying your target audience meaning your potential buyers in the market. So when talking about target audience, 
uh, your analysis should include some subjects which are important. These can be demographic information about your potential buyers, or these can be psychographic information or just some behavioral factors. Like what? You can see some examples on the slide. Like the age. What is the age range of your target market? Are they Z generation, millennials, X generation? What are your thoughts about that? Talking about gender, is the product targeted towards a specific gender? What disposable income ranges does your target audience have? So you may specify a range about that. What languages does your target audience speak? Maybe type of jobs they have or professions can be an important issue for you too. So you may like to discover what are the types of jobs or professions that are common within the target market. Then talking about the psychographic information, we can talk about the lifestyles or personality traits. So there you can talk about what are the interests, hobbies and activities of your target audience. Are there specific personality traits that characterize your target audience? So what you see as common in your target market. Then you can talk about some buying behaviors like how does a target market make purchasing decisions? How frequently do they purchase products or are they loyal to uh, specific brands and if you just discover that why why do you think it happens like that and decision making process is important too you can influence there emphasize what factors influence the decision making process within your target audience so these will all help you to know your customers your potential buyers in the marketplace well and if you know them well you will have the chance to uh, come up with a product that meets their wants and needs. So that's important. Then we jump up to the second phase of your marketing plan, uh, which is a competition analysis. So for the competitive analysis, uh, you examine competitors in the marketplace. You should determine which brands, which products are your substitutes, which are your direct uh, competition and you should be also evaluating those products and you will be anal you should have analyze their strengths and weaknesses and how your brand can position itself effectively against them so what will your product offer different than your competitors so here you can also talk about your similarities with the other products your different features you have you can talk about your strengths and weaknesses who is the domain who dominates the market so how uh, what is the potential uh, share you might you might get in the market and uh, what are your competitors promote as their unique selling point meaning this is a marketing concept the unique selling proposition we call it as so it refers to your unique and distinctive qualities or benefits that set your product apart from its competitors in the eyes of your target audience. So it's important for your customers because it's going to change your attitudes towards brands. And you can also uh, analyze where and how your competitors promote and sell their products. Because if you see that your competitors are placed in the marketplace or they sell in their own virtual shops, this will give you a lot of information to maybe differentiate your product or be in the same place with them so that you can take some share from their customers. Then in the third part, we have the marketing strategies. This is also important for shaping your marketing mix. As most of you have already known, with the marketing mix means uh, the strategies you, will, strategies you will set for your product, its price level, the place where you are going to distribute it, where you, where you are going to place your product, and the promotion strategies. So uh, by marketing strategies, you will learn key strategies for becoming a sustainable brand, which we will be talking about it in the next classes. So we will talk about a sustainable marketing plan. Um, so the marketing strategies will help you to come up with some tactics or strategies uh, that you will be using to uh, reach your target audience because you have to engage with your target audience and you will have to choose some channels 
to communicate with your target audience. So you can here talk about your social media campaigns, uh, what will be your campaign objectives, what will be your message to your target audience, your slogans, and which channels you are going to use to spread, spread out your message. And also here we can talk about the creation of visual and written content of your media campaigns. You can include visuals here and other creative materials. So in the upcoming lessons, we will be talking about those. So please keep in mind of these questions you see here in the third part. So how and where will you announce the availability of your product to your target audience? So this should all be included in your marketing plan. So how often do you advertise? Will you advertise in what ways? So this can be daily, weekly, and monthly. And by the way, while talking about uh, reaching your audience, you can use different channels like yes, social media, second life media, or you can even use real life media. So you have you may just connect them all together, but it should, uh, of course, make sense and be parallel to your uh, marketing objectives. How will you help endorse your product in Second Life and real life? And you can also include uh, your relationship with the real world companies, as you can see on the slide. So what real world companies would be interested in your product as a way to help promote their own businesses? And also what real world nonprofits would be interested in your product as a way to help promote their own causes? So think about some real world companies or nonprofit ones and how we can collaborate with them. So this is where you are going to be totally creative. Then for the fourth part, here comes the budget allocation. This is an important step too. So how much are you planning to allocate for production and other costs? The other costs can be your advertising and promotion costs. Think about those two. So in order to make such an analysis, you can answer these questions, work on these. How many hours did it take your team to research your product idea? How many hours did it take your team to make custom shapes? texture scripts for your final product. How much did you have to pay a third party party developer to make custom shapes, textures, or scripts? So if you're making all your scripts and other stuff original, that's wonderful. But if you're buying something from the Second Life world, then you have to come out, count your, how much you have paid and what are your costs for making this production step. You will also have costs for advertising. Here we will mention how much it will cost to advertise your product within Second Life or the other medias you are going to use and how much it will cost to advertise your product in real life. You can talk about numbers here. So the aim is to create a budget. So after uh, all of this planning, here comes the implementation part. This is where you are going to launch your products in the marketplace and you will start selling them. Please keep in mind that on the next lesson, which is the 4th of December, uh, you are going to make your product demonstrations, meaning you have to finalize your products, your uh, selling areas, the presentation areas, areas by the 4th of December. And then you are going to start, just you will be launching your product and you are going to start selling your product. And you will also monitor your sales you will have a chance to see how much you have sold, what is the performance of your product in the marketplace. And by the time we get to the final week, uh, you will have time to make revisions in your product or your marketing strategies. You can change them, you can improve them. So you will have a chance to have a real entrepreneurship experience here in Second Life. So you will have the key performance indicators as written in the slide, the KPIs, these can be your sales and revenues. You should monitor your sales per day, your revenues per week or month. And this is where you can measure up your success. So it's an important KPI. So these are all the important steps for creating your marketing plan. Do you have any questions? Okay. Um, today we're going to talk about virtual economies and um, you are meta entrepreneurs in uh, metaverse and a uh, virtual platform right now and this course is all about you uh, acting as an entrepreneur in a virtual environment 
which is part of a virtual economy. And um, we're going to talk about this virtual economy and the basics of it and its potential probably for the next years. Um, one thing about this virtual uh, economy is uh, it's real. Even the first part of the word is virtual. Uh, we're talking about real money, real value. And this value and money is also uh, very similar to a normal economic system. Basically, there are consumers, there are uh, people who are spending money in the market, there are sellers, uh, creators or the producers of the market, and as well as uh, there are uh, people who can, uh, who can uh, be mediators in between. So, or companies. So that is the thing that is uh, real and we are going to be part of this in this course, this economic system. And I'm going to talk about that now for you. Um, today, uh, maybe you all are uh, playing games, online games. Uh, if any of you can, can you, can you type why if you play online games now? from your mobile phones or desktop or even the consoles. Are you playing any games? Type Y if you do, please. Type Y. Are you guys playing any games right now in any platform, a console, a mobile, or a computer? OK. The follow-up question is, for those who play games, do you spend money in those games? Okay, some of you says no, some of you says yes, it's almost like 50-50 by now. So, what you see on the screen is the slide, in the slide. Um, the spending on the online games is around $100 billion now. And it is sometimes to buy that game, but also we are now spending inside the games like we are buying content or we are buying certain uh, weapons or uh, accessories for your character in the game uh, or you're buying some uh, extra uh, equipment for your own character in the game so those are uh, or sometimes to level up you need to spend money inside the game or to make it faster so one time uh, many years ago i've seen a documentary on TV and that was about um, a guy who is living in California he has a company and in this company uh, the customers were gamers the gamers were basically uh, sending their account to this guy's company this guy gives this account of the gamers to his employees and those employees play the games for you just to level up your character in certain games because then they can play with their own friends. They have a group of like bankers, for example, or people working in Silicon Valley. They don't have enough time to play the game to evolve in the game. So what they do is they kind of buy this service from this guy. They send their uh, character's account, password and the name, and then they are uh, playing the game for him or for her to level up his or her character uh, so that he or she can catch up with his own friends while playing the games. And guess what? The workers, the employees of this guy, he's in California, he, has, he owns the camp company, but the uh, employees of this guy are living in Philippines or in Romania. He was talking about an open, opening a new branch in Romania. 
And there are sometimes teenage kids are working for him just to level up the characters. They are very efficient in the game. They, it's, it's their uh, age, you know, it's like their, their, their time to work with this. And they can, they can do really a good job with uh, gaming. And they are leveling up for, for the, uh, this company, for the uh, product. And that is what they sell. And this is kind of telling us the gamers are really want to achieve something in the, those games. And they pay more, extra. And they can pay for leveling up. They can pay for uh, buying virtual items for their characters and so on. And this economy becomes so large, it becomes $100 billion dollars. And those are virtual products we're talking about there or virtual services we're talking about there. And those are part of the virtual economy that we have today. They play a big part of that. Some people consider Second Life as a game as well. Some don't. Some take it more seriously here. But then it's, it's to have fun. We, most of the people come here to have fun in these platforms. And those are uh, the examples of the games that you see on the screen right now. Maybe you heard some of those games like Grand Theft Auto, Among Us, the Red Dead Redemption, and so on. Now, the thing is, whatever you buy in those games or in Second Life is owned by a company. It's not yours. Even though you think so, you are paying some rental fee, basically, for the items that you own. What that means is, whatever you wear right now as clothes on your avatars, the owner is Linden Labs, basically. You think so, it is yours, but then what if they shut down their servers? You have nothing left in your hands the next day. So... It's basically owned, not owned by us, or even you are the creator of something, like you are creating products in your own project right now. Those are, you think every every right to for for those products are yours, but not not necessarily. I mean, in a, in a way, if you think the Second Life platform, the Linden Lab owns it. That's the that's one of the main issues that we're talking today, the property rights we mentioned before is a very important issue in this course. And this property rights is somehow related with the NFTs, non-fungible tokens today. These NFTs, you have heard about it, right? All of you guys, you heard about the NFTs? Yes. So these NFTs, we usually used it with art items, for example. We heard about the digital art items, which are also NFTs, which means it's, uh, it's, it's, it's cryptid. So it's like uh, it's, it's kind of um, have a code that no one can solve it. And you, you own that code and then kind of you own that object. So no one can copy it unless you give permission or you sell it or you... Uh, you are willing to uh, make it available for others. It's up to you. So the last year, 24 billion worth of NFTs were traded by nearly 1 million people. Okay, so the number of NFTs are increasing. We are talking about 1 million different people all around the world. They are creating some virtual products or virtual items uh, or digital art or any piece with NFTs. And uh, of the 24 billion worth of transactions, 20 billion were paid to the NFT producers. So 90% of the money gone to the producers, creators of those objects. That is a new thing for the virtual economy. There's a new thing for us in this economy model of economy because most of the time everything was owned by the companies or the old platforms are owned by a company that we use a tech company and we were paying them we were making the facebook 
years ago, with our beta, we made them rich. We kind of gave our beta to them, and that's what they sold. That's what they earn money from. And we create the objects, we create the environments in a platform like this. Then this platform becomes famous, and then a lot of users comes here, and the company, the corporations earn money. But what happens to the creators? What do they get out of that? Not much. Most of the time, we were not getting much out of it. Just the value that we got is the fun that we get from what we did. That was the one of the main problem uh, with the system. But this NFT technology can change that and turn into something uh, more decentralized instead of centralized. Centralized may, means that one company, one government, or one management is managing everything. So, but decentralized is the users are the main asset there, and users you uh, have the uh, decision making, and they decide what to do, they decide what to sell, they decide what to own. So that is what happen. What is going to happen in metaverse? That is what we foresee for now. We are hoping that the users own the platforms instead of the corporations and companies. I mean, I don't say that they are out of the game. I don't say that they're not going to be here. They're not going to be the, you know, uh, playing a part in this game. But their part will be much limited compared to what it is today. So there is a comparison here as well. Like to make a comparison, we can say this. Spotify music platform, you all probably heard about that as well, uh, which has more than 8 million users, has only paid 8 billion to content creators. Most of the money went to the Spotify. They earn much more money than what the creators did. All those songs that you listen, the creators of those songs, they did not get much out of that. There was a case years, years ago, probably you, you don't even uh, heard those uh, when you were uh, when you were babies or not born even at that time. There was a company called Napster. Napster was kind of uh, providing MP3 music files and you could be a member of that Napster and you could download any music for free. So suddenly the record companies, the recording companies, um, they realized that they were out of the game. They were kind of pushing them out of the game. And the singers, they were not getting their royalties. They, the, you know, the producers of the music, uh, they, they were not getting what they wanted to get from the market because everyone was able to download anything from anyone in the world. We were sharing our music. I, I was part of that. Uh, system as well like I was downloading music like uh, when I was a college student by then and then I was I was downloading a lot of music for free and then suddenly the recording companies they kind of uh, sued the company they took the Napster to the court and they took everything back from them but that was the beginning those were the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, systems that uh, they kind of came up with that technology was new and we were able to download content from each other computers. Like I could I could connect to uh, Betty One's computer and I was seeing her files, her uh, music, and then I could download it to my computer. That was the system. So that started from then. It was year, it was around year, year 2000, 2001, around so. And the guy who who found out the uh, Napster was also uh, taking a role while they were building that Facebook. After that, he was out of the uh, he was in, he was uh, out of the um, business because they, they took him to court, and then he joined the Facebook at the beginning of the Facebook story. Anyway, that is what it was then, and now today we have even bigger. Because now we have a, a new thing, which is users create contents. The people like you, like me, we can connect here, we can create something here and put it in the world. That exists what we create. The problem is who owns it? 
And do I have the right to sell it? If so, how much of the value goes to my pocket and how much of the value goes to the platform that I am part of? Because at the end, we are using their system. We are using their servers. So we are kind of costing them second life, I mean. We have to pay something to them as well. We cannot just kick them out of the system. But then uh, it is at the same time very, very uh, sad that the creators doesn't get what they deserve from these systems. <clears throat> so the global virtual goods market generated revenue of around 67.5 billion in 2021 and is anticipated to grow a cumulative annual growth rate over 20% during the forecast period from 2022 to 2028 to reach around 203 billion in 2028 so um you you were all witnessed uh, you all witnessed the when Facebook changed its name Meta and Metaverse platforms like this became very, very well known and famous in the world. Everybody started to talk about the Metaverse. They started to buy crazily lands in Metaverse. Uh, they were selling uh, lands to each other people and they talk about, you know what? A new technology, a new world came to us and now we have um, all those uh new platforms we could be part of and it's gonna be cool it's like it's gonna be like the science fiction movies but of course it doesn't happen that fast and we know it from the past we know the technologies if you look at back to 1995 that is the time that electronic commerce started and when electronic commerce started uh from 1995 there was another thing they found out they found they come up with a new technology called web and this web technology allows some companies some organizations create websites and put it on internet everyone around the world can connect to that that started in 1995 and from 1995 they said you know what we found an amazing technology and an amazing technology is uh, here and it's going to change our lives forever. Some people believe in that and invested. A lot of rich people invested in this. The thing is, they wait, 1996, 1997, 1998. They did not see the progress as they wish they, sh they would see. It was, you know, uh, revolutionary technology revolutionary system they built but then it was not giving the results yet it was 1999 and it was 2000 year 2000 it's called something called dot com bubble dot or that is the extension of the websites as you know and those are the tech companies have these extensions. Google.com or <coughs> HP.com or whatever. Those companies, they were, most of them were startups by then. Startup companies. And what happened was they kind of could not evolve as they wished until 2000. And they were kind of in a crisis. The investors started to take their money back they want they were they stopped investing in that technology and the in what in e-commerce technology and the internet technology at that time and they get into a big crisis their stock prices dropped drastically in short time a lot of engineers who are working for this com these companies are on were on stock options and they were having crisis uh, life crisis, economic crisis, everything comes one, one, one after each other. So it was a big collapse that we have seen in the Silicon Valley and also affecting the world because the whole technology was rooted in there and spreading to the world. That happened 
in year 2000, but after that, they wait a little bit more. And all those investments in years, they started to give its fruits. They, we started to collect the outcome from those investments. Millions, maybe billions of dollars were invested in different technologies uh, related to e-commerce, related to internet, web pages, and so on. And what we have seen was Web2. Web2 came to us, and these Web2, the users like us, started to be content creators like Facebook, like Twitter, and other technologies. Yeah. That changed the game. That changed the game for us because that is part of the uh, changing the environment. Millions were producing at the same time instead of a bunch of engineers in certain companies. Millions were creating content. So it's gradually, it, it kind of gradually expanded the digital platforms. The content of those platforms gradually extended. And that changed the rule of the game for many things. And after that, after a consolidation period around 2007 or so, since then, we, we did not see any drop in the graphic. The technology took off from there, e-commerce, and now we are buying all our groceries from online. Even uh, we are buying a lot of discounted products from many online stores. Uh, we, got, we, we are um, uh, reaching international markets as consumers, and we could buy something from China today and deliver it to your door the next day, maybe a couple of days later, whatever. So that is the thing that is that that changed the, everything, but it took time. And now the same thing hap is happening with the metaverse. I think we are, uh, I mean, the, the whole kind of PR event was by made by Meta at first, and everybody heard about this. And then uh, it was after the pandemic, a lot of people started to use these digital platforms and the metaverse. We kind of felt like we needed it because you never know when is the next pandemic going to hit us or you never you, you never thought about it even before the pandemic. Did you think about that? You will be uh, living in your house uh, in a closed environment for a year or so. Uh, most of the time you don't go out. If you go out, you wear a mask. We, we did not envision that. We did not see that coming. But it came and it happened. And while it, it was happening, uh, Second Life was very popular. It, like normally 30,000, 40,000 online users at a time in average in Second Life. During the pandemic, it was 50, 60,000. So it kind of doubled its residence number uh, in those years. Because we need it. We needed socialization. We needed to have fun with our friends. We needed uh, to reach the other people where are they li wherever they are living. So it was allowing us to do all those things here. It was allowing us to go to a restaurant here, if you could, or a club here. So that was a kind of revolutionary technology for us, and it was good for us. <clears throat> that is the thing. Uh, what is... Uh, what, what, what has happened to the e-commerce and the uh, internet technology back then, and that is happening to Metaverse, in my opinion. And it is going to take off, believe me, because uh, last year, uh, when, when Meta was kind of uh, invested in this Metaverse, they invested around $10 billion alone. Just the former Facebook invested in these technologies. And after that, we have seen around $120 billion investment in these technologies. We, are, we haven't seen the results of those investments. We haven't seen the results of those RD, research and development, going on about this subject. And we are going to see that. We are going to hear about that. We are going to see new technologies and things coming up with, related to the metaverse very soon, I believe. And when that happens, that will get attention again. And people will start to think once again about the metaverse, and they will try new things here. For example, we started teaching here in this uh, virtual world. 
it was before the pandemic we started that because we thought it was kind of a good instrument to use for teaching instead of uh, seeing myself face to face every day it was different for the students to come up here with avatars we made a lot of interviews about it and they were saying the students were saying like yourselves uh, they were giving us feedback like you know what I, I can talk to you more freely here in second life than face to face they told me as a professor for example so it's kind of different psychology behind it different uh, actions behind it and also uh, different um, technologies that we're using here may be teaching you in a different way that is what we are testing here for years we have been doing this and we think it is positive like we could use this maybe not the only way of education not the mean of education will be this right? we are not saying that but this could be used in a hybrid way with other technologies and other and uh, new things and it allows us to be with international professors here without paying the logistics and you know bring bringing them here to turkey like sidearm here among us is living in the united states and he's with us almost every week here so that is the fruit of this technology that is the thing that it allows us to do uh, john o'connor he is visiting us from Ireland, another professor. Val from USA, she was with us. Uh, Gentle, Heron, she was with us. So we got a lot of people. Delia Lake, every week, yes, every week, and uh, not, not even once, actually. He, he is with in other, another cl class also. He's part of that class, and he's there as well. So we got a lot of participants from international arena and uh, that allows us to do that. It, it, you cannot do that in a physical classroom, at, in, in living in Adana and Mersin, and you know, bringing up all those international professors together uh, without paying the flight tickets and everything else. So that is really, really a benefit for us and for you as well. You are getting to know many different people from all around the world, getting their uh, you know, getting uh, to know their culture, their thoughts about different uh, things, technology today or the entrepreneurship. What do they think? What What does an American think about the meta entrepreneurship you hear in this course? That is some value that has some value for us. And that is why we are doing it here. And maybe it will be the mean of education. It will be more spread. It will be more uh, commonly used. Now, the next step for us is we are trying to integrate VR goggles. Those big glasses, you know, that you could see 3D environments. Uh, real videos in 3D you can watch and so on. So now we want to integrate those in certain courses and in even in this course the last week we're going to invite you to the campus and we're going to show you this technology now we have a lab in uh, at, at the university and we're going to use it uh, we want to use it in collaboration with american universities or irish universities so that is the projects that we are after right now but then that is something new also it is evolving and with all those investments in those technologies, they're going to produce even more tools for us that we could use to use in education, to use in entrepreneurship, to use in uh, business markets. You can come up with different ideas of products. Every new thing comes up with an opportunity for, for you. You can be the future entrepreneurs and take advantage of those. You could be the pioneers in those areas because you are maybe the you know, one of the first group in Turkey, or maybe in, I don't know, many, many parts of the world as well, making a meta entrepreneurship course in a 3D environment. Think about that. That is something new that you are part of. And that is something that nobody else is doing. That is valuable. If you are, if, if anything is rare in, in a market, it has a value more than normal values like if gold is less in the market gold is expensive if a uh, gem a uh, kind of a uh, 
valuable stone is rare, which is like, uh, I don't know, uh, name me some, something valuable like, uh, uh, what is the name of it? Diamonds. It, it didn't came to me. Diamonds, they are very rare and very, very expensive, right? So that is the same thing for you. You are maybe some of the people who are taking this course as meta entrepreneurs. You don't have many around you. You don't have many meta entrepreneurs around you. So you could do something that they didn't even think of, that they exist. So that is the chance for you. Use it. Use it wisely. That is my advice to you guys. That is what I'm trying to do. There is no other professors around us uh, other than Dahlia, uh, Ginger, and um, Gigi uh, at our school who are using these technologies. So we are kind of pioneers in that as a group, and we try to use it as an advantage for us. We try to come up with articles. We try to come up with... Uh, scientific uh, production about this, what we are doing, so that we will be unique in the market. That is a chance, okay? So, um, that's uh, pretty much what I would like to talk about today. Uh, the importance of the virtual economy, what we're doing here related to that, as well as the new technologies like the NFTs and the, um, how they are how they could be making or providing a better future for us. Here we go. This is Metaverse Economics Part 2. Second life is a virtual economy. According to Roblox, a virtual economy exists in a virtual or digital world where users perform economic activities and transactions in exchange for virtual or real assets. It involves the exchange of virtual goods, services, and currencies that can only be used within the virtual environment or for real economic benefit. Second life is a virtual economy. In second life, the medium of exchange is called the Linden dollar or L dollar or dollar L. Any resident in Second Life, that's you, has the, ri the right to create and sell products and services in Second Life in exchange for Linden dollars. The average exchange rate is 250 linen dollars for one US dollar. Consumers can purchase linen dollars using their real world bank accounts and then buy the products inside Second Life from Second Life developers. You've already done this. Developers can cash out their Linden dollars back for real-world currency to their real-world bank accounts. Developers can sell in-world with no commission, no transaction fee. I could sell you this slide board and I would get all the money. Developers can sell on the Second Life Marketplace for a commission of 
if I put my slides on the marketplace and you bought them, I would get 90% of the price. Next slide. Virtual and physical economies have differing cost models. In terms of product design, both virtual and physical economies cost the same in terms of research, market analysis, idea sketching, brainstorming, testing, and so on. That's what you guys have been doing, designing your product, and it takes hours. Similarly, the cost to make the first product is the same in terms of time. It takes hours to come up with a virtual product, it takes hours to come up with the first physical product. However, in the physical world, you also have to pay for the materials. Once the first product is made in a virtual economy, replicating it is zero cost because it is digital. Just make another copy. Whereas in the physical world, you still have to pay for more materials and manufacturing facilities. The virtual world also does not need to store inventory, whereas the physical world does. And in the virtual economy, there is no cost to distribute because products are delivered digitally whereas in the physical world, shipping costs are incurred. Both of these economies incur a cost of vending, something called a transaction fee. The vending fee can be much lower in the virtual economy and is typically higher in the physical. Sales unit prices are typically lower in the virtual economy, higher in the physical economy. And depending on product popularity, both virtual and physical economies can have very low sales or very high sales per month. Moving on to the next slide. Second Life is a canonical 3D metaverse platform. A canonical metaverse is an immersive, digitally embodied 3D computer-generated universe. Second Life is a canonical 3D metaverse. In terms of monthly average users, Roblox, Minecraft, VR Chat, and Second Life are in the top 10 platforms. These are monthly average users. The top 10 have a total of a half billion users per month 
which is roughly 10% of the world's adult population. Adult meaning 20 years or older, like yourself. In terms of virtual economies, only Roblox, VR Chat, and Second Life allow residents the right to create and sell their own work within the platform. Canonical virtual economies are mature. Second Life is 20 years old, and many of the most successful producers have been residents for 10 years or more. The most popular products include entire environments such as landscapes, venues such as themed clubs, and especially lifestyle, like houses, airplanes, boats, yachts, and fashion, women's and men's dress and accessories. There are many thousands of communities of shared interest focusing on lifestyle, arts, games, and other themes. The extended 2D plus 3D metaverse enhances physical brands. An extended metaverse is an evolving ecosystem of digitally and physically connected apps. I'm going to repeat this. An extended 3D plus 2D metaverse is an evolving ecosystem of digitally and physically connected apps. Mobile devices are now owned by three quarter of the world's population, six billion. Delivering combined two-dimensional and three-dimensional experiences by mobile device is an emerging market. Walmart and Snap AR are examples of allowing a user to upload a picture of their own body and try on outfits in a virtual fitting room. Warby Parker does the same thing with ordering custom eyewear. And L'Oreal with trying on cosmetics in a virtual beauty counter rather than in a real world store. Online and metaverse economies are merging. Online economies include eBay, from which came PayPal, the ability to buy things online. Then Amazon, 
which not only took credit cards, but branched out to offer online sale services to other real-world producers. Similarly, in order to manage the Lindex real-world financial regulations, Linden Lab started a company called Tilia, which has recently formed a partnership with J.P. Morgan. This partnership offers the opportunity for other virtual economies to allow exchange of legal tender for metaverse platform internal currencies. Although companies like Roblox and VR Chat still continue to use their own exchange services for now. In terms of earning enough money to support a physical world lifestyle, like paying for your food, paying for your rent, paying for your electricity and water and utilities, virtual economies only work for a small percent of their residents. Roblox reports that about 10,000 of its 5 million creators make $100,000 a year. It is likely that these high earners are actually corporations who are increasingly present in Roblox, such as Walmart, rather than individuals or small businesses. For in-world sales, Second Life is an excellent metaverse economy in which to test and learn principles of design and marketing and sales within a safe environment to then proceed into the real world. This is a long proven benefit of simulation, training for real world endeavors. In terms of earning money by using virtual worlds to make movies for ads and sales and promotional campaigns, this has become an increasingly active area. But results are still mixed. Despite mixed results, there is no telling where things are going in the future, except that they will be chaotic. The issues and debates on replication, copyright of digital products such as music and books continue. And now we have artificial intelligence, big data, NFTs, and cryptocurrencies in the headlines. What are a few guidelines to help us navigate this expanding world of metaverse economies? The virtual world is an extension of the physical world and it is here to stay. Become literate in 3D. Learn to express yourself in 3D. And people everywhere are driven by the same core needs to survive, to grow, to love, to contribute, and to leave a legacy. This concludes part two of
metaverse economies.